Ladies and gentlemen, we're live here at Myth Vision Podcast. This is a live stream. I'm your host, Derek Lambert, and we're going to talk about the wife of God, the wife of Yahweh. And of course, you have various deities in the pantheon of gods and the Canaanites and such. But um, is it true that God divorced his wife, Asherah? Is it true the ancient Israelites worshipped a goddess along with God? And that there were two deities, not just one. Today, I have a special guest again. The last video we did with him is quite shocking. It literally sent sound waves to the internet world, and he got a lot of attention. We got a lot of attention with that video. In this one, I hope the same happens. So, no wasting time today. I have Dr. Matthew Munger joining us. Welcome back to Myth Vision, my friend. Hey, thanks for having me, Derek. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, if you don't mind me calling you Matt, uh, short. Call or, me whatever uh, you want. Call, okay. I'm, okay. Munger. I'm Bible Munger. That's good. <laughs> What's your background? Why, why are you someone who could speak on this topic? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the reason I can speak on this topic is because I've studied the Bible for, for 20 years and this is part of my, my background. And so I, I mean, I have my, my bachelor's degree in theology and biblical studies, my M my master's in theology and old Testament studies. I have a BA in linguistics and MA in Semitic philology and a PhD in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I've, I've worked my way through the old Testament world, the ancient Semitic world. And, and that's the language and cultures that I've studied the most. And, and that's been the interest that I've had really is getting to know these things. And, uh, and so the reason to this topic, the uh, Asherah and, and Yahweh is just that I've been, I've been working on a video on a, on a thing from my own channel where I'm looking at the, um, the Deuteronomistic history and the way this, the histories were, were written backwards, were, were written from the end of Israelite history or Judean history and looking backwards and asking what went wrong. And, and then one of those topics is that I've had to go back into and, and work through is the question of who is Asherah? And so that kind of got me going. And so when you mentioned that you wanted to do something on this, that was, it was perfect timing. Cause I've been, I've been digging into this a little more recently. Yeah. Shameless plug. I did not know that you've launched three additional videos to the first one, which went quite, uh, or it's this one, sorry. Yeah, the first that one, one's the, up two other ones there. Yeah. Yeah. This shows obvious intertextuality <laughs> between Genesis 1 and Enuma Elish. And I'm actually working on a series Joshua Bowen actually scripted for me on this yeah. very subject. So we're, there's like, we're collabing here in a, in a way. So I hope yep. we can, by the end of this, I'm going to refresh this and i hope we see the growth you the witnesses those who are sitting here that are going to share the gospel of myth vision and bible monger can actually help contribute in growing the subscriber count if you have not subscribed to dr matthew munger please do so during this stream he also has a website biblemonger.com is this a blog site well, yeah, I mean, it, it, when I when I get time, I'm going to write more on it. Right now, I'm using it to post resources and links and stuff connected to the videos that I'm doing on my YouTube channel. And okay. then I'll be adding adding texts and blogs and and more discussions of the of the stuff after a while. But uh, just kind of just as a as a supplement to what I'm putting out on the YouTube thing and kind of right. trying to collect so that people can find the text and see what kind of stuff I'm actually putting into it. So it's not just videos floating around on the internet, but I I, I am doing serious work behind it and I want people to be yeah. able to check out the the text for themselves. Cause that's kind of my my thing. I want people to be able to read the text themselves and I want to look at texts. I want to go into details uh, about the text while we're, while we're looking at them. And that is something that, yeah, I like to just make transparent of what, what background you can, you can get into. That's what I really loved about your Enuma Elish video. Like you're, you're wanting people to see, actually see with their own eyes what's going on. And that helps teach that helps actually solidify the points you're making real quick shameless plug for us because we really want to keep growing and bringing you this information we have the patreon you can join the family go down here harass me private message me i am a busy guy but i'm doing so much material i could use your help so please help us out 
We also have the MVPCourses.com, which has several academics, and we're growing. This one right here is not shining bright because I haven't spent a lot of time like getting people's attention to it. It's an 18-lecture course with Dennis R. McDonald. And, of course, I was actually privileged to be able to join him in that course. And it's beautiful. So please sign up for our courses. Educate yourself to know what the latest, greatest, and what these scholars say in these topics. Anyway, all 4K, high quality. We take you through the material. Now back to Dr. Munger. Dr. Munger, what's going on with Asherah? Is it true that Yahweh had a wife named Asherah? So, uh, I, I, you know, if we start from the from the end, it was funny. I got a text from my brother this morning who, who lives in Colorado. And I saw, I don't know, it might have been last night his time. But he texted me, he said, Yahweh's divorce or sacred divorce or something. And I was like, wait, divorce? I didn't say anything about divorce. And so I was like, where'd you get that? And he's like, oh, your buddy Derek wrote it on Facebook. And I was like, okay. So, yeah. but I guess it's it's something that does make sense to to question is when we think of Yahweh as a as a bachelor, uh, I guess um, as a singular single single dude, um, how could we imagine him as as having had a wife? And so we must have we must have just thought uh, or must have just assumed that he went through a divorce process at some point, um, which which actually is a really really nice illustration of what I think is going on. Because when we talk about whether or not Yahweh had a wife, um, we're just using human terms to try to explain uh, the divine, right? Because obviously, um, like we we we're not saying that the divine had a wedding ceremony and married another goddess or something like that. Like we're, we're talking about trying to picture how does the divine world function? And, and so, yeah. So then, then the answer to your question is, uh, there is, there is no reason to doubt that ancient Israelites conceived of Yahweh as having a consort or wife or partner. Uh, and this is um, this we can say from from a, a variety of different angles, and so I think like if you want, we can just walk through some of the steps that I would walk through to to get to that conclusion. Um, you want me to share the screen? Uh, so I yeah you uh, you can or I, I yeah share the screen. We'll we'll jump to the slides. I put it in there. Um, Excellent. Yeah. So uh, if we what we can do is start. Um, by thinking about this the way I think um, an apologist would actually meet it. Um, so one of the one of the reasons why someone would say, no, the, Yahweh is alone and he's the only God and he's the only one that exists um, is because the in the Bible in the biblical texts, we have a lot of um, let's see a lot of, a lot of polemic against the idea of other gods having any power, the existence of other gods. And so I wanted to start by looking at this text from Deuteronomy 7, which is kind of the, the beginning of, of, the, of the story of what happens to Israel. So in Deuteronomy um, is, is written in a way that kind of says, this is what it's going to be like when you get into the land and then kind of continues through Joshua and Judges and Samuel and Kings of what happens when they do go in. And so this kind of programmatic speech that that Moses gives in, in Deuteronomy 7 says says a lot. Now, I just want to read through it. It's actually, it's a quite a, quite a long text, but hang, hang with me here. Um, so when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are about to enter and occupy, and he clears away the nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations mightier and more numerous than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, and then you utterly destroy them, make no covenant with them and show no mercy. Um, do not intermarry with them giving your sons and daughters to their sons and for taking daughters for your sons or well, I missed that up but for what um, for that would turn away your children from following me to serve other gods the anger of the lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly 
but this is how you must deal with them. Break down their altars, smash their pillars, hew down their sacred poles, and burn their idols with fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. So that's Deuteronomy chapter 7. Now, what we notice in this text is that uh, that it's it's very clear that the there are a lot of conditions that are put in place here so that God will take care of his chosen people, his treasured people, right? They have to kill all the people. They have to, they have to not intermarry with them. They have to burn down all their idols and all this kind of stuff. And then, and only then, will God actually take care of his chosen people, is what the text says. And, and so one of the things that we are pretty clear about in in working with texts from a from a historical perspective is that these are written after the fact so this isn't something that's written the day that you know this isn't an actual speech moses gives a, at the border of of the land these are words that are written down hundreds of years after that should have happened and they are looking backwards on what did happen and so this is part of a much longer history that ends with the destruction of Israel and Judah. Can, and can so I, can yeah. I just like I, I like emphasizing and I hope our audience uh, can appreciate this. I understand that it's interrupting the flow of you discussing. No, 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 this, right? I want this to be interactive, of course, as much as possible, because what you're suggesting just for dumb dumbs like me is that the authors who are writing this. They're explaining why bad things are happening to their people, to put it in dum-dum terms. And they're finding precedence in the worship and the religious practices that are not under their kosher rule of what is supposed to be practiced. So why did God do what he did to the northern kingdom? Aha, look at these Asherah poles. Look at all these other divinities. Look at what you guys are doing that isn't our specific elitist perception of religion. Or why did Babylon kick our ass in the south? Oh, uh -huh, this is why. And so you're simply saying, looking backwards, they're trying to blame game why all the bad stuff is happening to us. Yes, exactly. Okay, and, and that's the and I mean, and this is the this is one of those things that I think it's 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 super logical. The first step of the discussion, like this, was written after the fact. And, and when we look at the books of everything from Deuteronomy up through the end of Kings, they are related in historical terms. They're written from the perspective of after the fall of Israel and Judah. And so we have this, this basic understanding that things are written about afterward. And then historians will always talk about what then is the bias or perspective or, or focus of that history writing. Right, so this is this is historiography. We're asking what is the motivation or the or the perspective of this history, and for the for the Deuteronomistic history and for for Deuteronomy, the focus is that well, they, there's two sides of the worship of God that they got wrong. The one thing is that they didn't get rid of all the other gods and their worship uh, places of worship and and shrines and poles and all that, and the second was that. God should only have been worshipped in one place, and that is the the temple in Jerusalem. And so, what we see when we when we look at it like that is that all of history then is interpreted through the lens of did we make the land free from all other gods and only worship God in Jerusalem, or did we muck it up? And mm. and that's like it's it. When we then start reading texts from that perspective, it makes a lot more sense because instead of saying, "Well, who were all these people that they were they, that they murdered?" it's instead saying, "Look, those are all the people that they that they were surrounded by, that they lived in contact with, and and if they'd only killed everybody and cleaned the whole place out, they wouldn't have been tempted to do other stuff." But it it doesn't mean that they were, went into it saying we're gonna just viciously murder absolutely everyone around us, right? Right. So, so when we get that perspective, then we can look at this text. And one of the things that the that they're told that they have to do is hew down the sacred poles. 
And the word that is here that meet that's translated in the NRSV as sacred poles is Asherahs. So this means literally, this is hew down their Asherahs and burn their idols with fire. And so this this word that's used here um, for for sacred poles uh, is literally the word Asherah, and it is used about forty times in the Bible. And so when we look at the way the word Asher is used, it's used often to mean a, a pole or something stuck in the ground. Um, and and the reason we we know this is because the language that's used with it is to cut down or to set up or to yeah to hew or to chop down things like that. And so the the language makes it very clear that these are these are like poles or trees or something like that. But in several cases, it's also clear that it means a divinity. And so when we when we look at um, a text like Second Kings 21, uh, we read about uh, the king Manasseh, who it says literally that he, uh, the carved image of Asherah that he had made, he set in the house which the Lord had said to David and his son Solomon in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. That's the temple. So in this text in, in Second Kings, we have, we have an actual description of a king of Judah who makes an image of Asherah and puts her in the temple beside Yahweh. I mean, it's, it's, it's right there. Yeah. yeah so this, yeah. It's, it doesn't get much plainer than that. <laughs> and so I think like, for me, that is, that's kind of a, a baseline when we want to talk about how was ancient Israelite and Judite religion, what were they doing? And that is the very clear thing is that they were worshiping Asherah beside Yahweh. And there were a few cases where the kings of Israel or Judah don't worship Asherah and cut down the Asherah poles and, and get rid of the, the, the Baal temples and things like that. But, but for the most part, the kings are described as having partaken in this, not having eradicated it. And so that gives us a, kind of a, a broad understanding of what is going on in that, that the Bible is describing. And so then you can you can look at it from from that perspective of okay we have this deity there what what is her purpose what does she do okay and then we can we can broaden that to look in the cultures around us and see is Asherah a known person okay and taking the the closest step would be to look at at Canaan or Canaanite religions and and what do you know, at, uh, at Ugarit, at, in the Ugaritic texts, we find a divinity, a, a goddess by the name of uh, Athirat. And the, the th, uh, the, like the th, uh, th in Athirat is cognate with uh, the, sh, the sheen that's in Asherah. So it's, it's the same name, it's just different lines of development in the in the Semitic languages. So Asherah and Athirat are, are the same name. And in the Ugaritic pantheon, Asherah or Athirat is the wife consort of El, the main god. Okay, hmm. so we we've got so that there. It, this is this is Using what we know about Deuteronomy 32, um, the Pantheon, El is Yahweh's, at least he's the chief deity in which I think Yahweh ends up merging with, but eventually, of course, overthrows in a sense. We There's no narrative, of course, to describe this of what's happening, but we do know that he becomes the chief um, among them. That would technically mean if Asherah is the wife of El, which is his dad— then he ends up in some type of religious setting married to his dad's wife. Well, uh, uh, you heard it here first. 
Um, <laughs> so, so I, but no, you you did exactly the right thing. See, this is why I like coming on your channel, Derek, because you anticipate exactly the next thing that I'm going to say. <laughs> And so you, Do I you spoil did, you it did, though? No, no, no. It's so good. It's so good because it actually seems like it makes me feel like I have logical arguments because right. when you say Deuteronomy 32, that's exactly where I was headed. And then we'll oh. go from there because when we go to Deuteronomy 32, we see that, okay, L is, is, it seems to be pictured exactly as the head of the pantheon that divvies up things to the other gods, right? And Yahweh is one of these, but that Deuteronomy 32 is actually an anomaly, right? In the in the Hebrew Bible, because it it doesn't erase the the hierarchy of the pantheon and leave leave Yahweh at the top, because Yahweh is supposed to be at the top of the pantheon in the Hebrew Bible, and and also Yahweh is El in the Hebrew Bible, and so we have we have a number of texts where El is used to describe the God of Israel. And so it's it's not like, I mean, not, a lot of the names, like so Elohim is is similar, but it's not using El, but but God is also called El, just El as God. And he's called El Elyon and El Shaddai and uh, all these different derivations, but that have the name El in them. So in, in a way, like you said, Yahweh takes over the role of El and his name in the Hebrew Bible. And so when we think about what then are ancient Israelites imagining when they're when they're dealing with their deity as compared to this other guy El and they're thinking our god is El we just call him Yahweh right mm -hmm. and El's consort wife woman whatever counterpart is Asherah and so there is no there there's no great leap like we don't even have I I think we can we can laugh a little bit about the Deuteronomy 32 and then the maybe it's daddy's wife but I think it's more of a power move to just say like no he th like in, for Yahweh it takes over and he becomes El and of course then it's his wife like it's or it's his consort like they belong together this is the this is the power couple and so you're you're like he's in charge and so of course then it makes sense that his consort is the chief consort from the other the other pantheons so there's being, being funny yeah, just being funny remember when paul was like telling people to give that guy over to satan for sleeping with his mother-in-law yeah whoops you should yeah. say it to your God. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> in the mirror. No, but that's right. But Paul says even looking in the mirror is so so foggy, he can't see anything. So exactly. <laughs> but yeah, so when we I mean, so what do I have next? Okay. So then we we ask ourselves then, and uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna save that for a second. I'm just gonna introduce it first. But the so what we what we see then is that in the religious world of the of ancient Canaan, ancient Israel, there is a conception that is entirely plausible and possible that's reflected in the Bible, and reflected in other texts, that the divinities had consorts and that Asherah is 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 most likely the one connected to Yahweh. And we have this confirmed in archaeological evidence. So this is now, uh, thank you. This is a an image of an inscription that is found in uh, Kibet al Kum, which is um, I mean, it's a it's a site in uh, northern Sinai where this um, th this so it's a, it's an upside down hand is what we see mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think, and it's so it's not a cow. It's not a, a that's, what, that's how my kids used to try and draw cows, I think. But the, um, I think it's a, I think it's an upside down hand, and so maybe it's the hand of God or something. I don't know. But it, on this text, it says, uh, "Blessed be your Yahu to Yahweh, now from his enemies to Asherah deliver him." Um, so it's, it's basically, it's this is a, this is a text that sets Yahweh and Asherah in the same, on the same side of things, right? So you're asking for a blessing to Yahweh and to, to Asherah be, be delivered. Um, oh, and by the way, this is from William Deaver's uh, book, Did God Have a Wife? So that's, uh, yeah, there it is. That is, this is, I mean, that's the, that was the, 
game changer book in scholarship that really laid out everything and and made it uh, made it really clear what's uh, what's going on. Um, yeah, and so then let's look at let's look at the next text. So there's another text then uh, from uh, for also from uh, the, the Sinai, um, and this time from Kuntilit uh, Ajrud, which is uh, just another site. But this is from a, a a, a pot or a, a jug. They're called pithos in uh, in in the archaeological lingo, and in here we have some some drawings or some etchings, and then you have some text. And on this one it says uh, Yahweh of Teman and Asherah. And so the question here is then, what is uh, what does this mean? Um, the it's it's a bit of a complicated linguistic argument because on the end of Asherah, there is a, a letter that normally when it's on the end of a word functions as a, as a pronoun. Uh, so it would mean like his uh, or something like that. But normally the names of people and gods don't take pronouns on the ends of them. And so it, there's there's still a debate in scholarship about whether this should be read Yahweh of Teman and his Asherah, or Yahweh of Teman and Asherah. Uh, so there's the it, I think the um, the the biggest you know the 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 biggest challenge with reading this text isn't whether or not Yahweh and Asherah belong together, but whether or not the linguistic details fall into place. Um, hmm. So from, I mean, we, we have one more example that's exactly the same, basically, also from the same place in another pithos, another jar that says, I, I, blessed, uh, I blessed to or by Yahweh of Samaria is probably what it says, and Asherah or his Asherah. And um, this, I borrowed the drawing from Dan McClellan's book. He's, um, he's coming on tomorrow, I think, so you yeah. can ask him about it. Um, but, uh, and hopefully he'll forgive me for borrowing his image from his book, but he's, uh, he's, he's a good, he's a, he's a good artist. This, this is his actual hand drawing of the thing. Um, and this one is really cool because here you have, um, some images and, and you definitely have, I mean, you have one guy that definitely is a man, the man's man in the front, um, with his, with his, um, junk hanging down. And that's what I was going to ask you about. <laughs> yeah. And that's, I mean, this is one of those uh, images of the divine that is definitely, um, is definitely making a statement, right? So the, here's a, here's the God figure with his, with his full package. And, and then, um, so, and likely the, then we have a, a, a female image in the very back. So the back one that's sitting and, and so again, we were faced with this inscription that is that is basically putting Yahweh and Asherah together on the on the in the text and probably in the image. Now, who the other fellow is is a little is a little uncertain. We, but you know, divine uh, relationships aren't always easy to make sense of. Uh, but. And this might not be a, an image of Yahweh and Asher at all. It might just be the three guys that were hanging out at the at the well or whatever. So I don't <laughs> want to put too much into it. I mean, there's there's lots of discussion about what uh, things. Some people look to uh, see uh, Egyptian images and and God uh, divine images from Egypt in it. And you know, I'm I'm not an expert in the Egyptian divine images, so I can't really say. But Deaver, Deaver made an interesting connection between the what what looks like a woman on the right seated on a chair that looks like a like a lion slash feathered type figure, and of course this yep. recreation it's more difficult to see. But um, that was his connection to I think the previous image you had up that there was yep. some correlation between the the, the goddess figure. Um, yeah, on that throne was it on that? Yeah. Uh, I think so on the on the left there. I think so. I, I could be wrong, but there's a couple different images he has. Yeah, and you can yeah. look at at Deaver's book. I mean, anybody who wants to really get into it, he goes through all the archaeological evidence, all of the all of the images, all of the inscriptions, all of the stuff, and and makes a really clear case for 
for seeing that this is Asherah and this is Yahweh and that are talked about in the text. And it's not a, not an anomaly that they're mentioned and mentioned together, but that this is this is just what people, normal people that were practicing the religion of ancient Israel, this is things that would have been perfectly within their conception of their God or gods. And, and that's one of those things that I think is, you know, is lacking when you only use the biblical text as a, as a basis, because you would, you would end up kind of thinking, oh, well, well, God hates all other gods. Therefore there were no other gods. But when you look at it from the perspective of, you know, the, the, folk religion or people's religion what were normal people doing then the the images are are actually quite the opposite because what we see is that all throughout israelite history all throughout judean history mm -hmm. that the the thing that's mentioned most in the history histories is that they worshiped other gods and that made yahweh mad so it's it doesn't it doesn't make sense from the perspective of history to say that Israelites had a God that that they that just didn't you know uh, allow anything else, it's much more logical that they were, you know, they were there worshiping all these other gods. Hmm. Hmm. And, and then, if you will give me, um, if you let me share my screen instead. Okay. Are we done so with the images here? Yeah, done. I think so. Let me. Yeah, that was the last one. So okay. and then I would just show. I would want to show. Um, uh, and I was actually going to pop somebody, up like just to show the, um, like on Google. I looked up Yahweh's yeah. uh, standing stones and stuff, and you notice there's two. Dan McClellan, of course, uh, does some drawing. There's two stones. What the heck? We know the stones represent a deity. So, you know, it doesn't prove who this deity is, but you'd be like, why are there two standing stones? Anywho. Um, yeah, no, but I just, I just jumped, uh, dumped uh, two links in your, in the private chat. So you okay. could, you could just pop those up because then we'll get the, so what, what I also want to talk about this last kind of step in making sense of this is, is again, in the, in the, area of archaeology and and what's actually going on in israel yeah it's perfect in the in israelite religion so these two yeah those two things there are um they are figurines that are found in in israel in judean sites that are that are images of women so this first one is uh it's it's held at the israel museum in in jerusalem and it's supposed to come from the from the 13th century so it's very early and it, it has an image of a woman um who uh, is uh it's it's considered a a fertility uh idol or mm -hmm. or, or a figurine right and so it you can see the two twins that she has inside her it's uh, around the you know kind of the breast area there's there's two babies so there's twins and they are, um, they, they, you know, they, they, it's assumed that then this is some kind of an amulet or or figurine that would be um, used to to help ensure fertility and and stuff like that. And that this is this is a pretty common thing found in in many different cultures throughout the throughout the world that you have fertility amulets or figures or things like that. Um, but then, if you go to the other one, uh, which is which is a little bit later, this is a this is a, uh, a 700, 700, around seven hundred, so probably eighth century, ninth eighth century. And the, these poles or these, sorry, these figurines <laughs> have a <laughs> have a have a, a very um, wide spread uh, find area. They are found. So the numbers are are a little hard to figure out for me because I'm I'm not into the, all the archaeology stuff. But but the the lowest source I've found says that there are 830 of these found in Judean sites. Mm. Um, William Deaver says it's at least a thousand, but maybe three thousand. And so they are all over the place, found in context connected to homes. They're found, some of them are found kind of like in, in dumps or around walls, but also inside Judean homes. 
And these are, some of them are obviously handmade, but also there are other ones that are mass produced, that are molded. And wow. so they, and what we see, I mean, this is a, a figurine of a, of a woman with large breasts that is a kind of, that she's supporting. And, and this is, this is considered to be a, like the type of Judean fertility uh, amulet or, or figurine that would be kept by people that are, you know, hoping to achieve better fertility, right? That they will survive the pregnancy, that their child will survive and all that kind of stuff, that their children will grow up to be healthy. And the, the thing about this is that they are so widespread that they are, they're obviously an integral part of ancient Judean or Israelite religion. These are the things that people are going to when they're trying to make sure that things happen in their favor. Mm. And, and so we can, we, we can discuss back and forth whether or not having a figure means that you're worshiping that deity or whether or not it's actually a symbol of Asherah. Um, but Asherah was a fertility goddess. She was the named goddess where there were images and pillars in, in Judah and in Israel. And then it, it makes perfect sense that this would also be a, a, the, the, the motivation for the pillars and their a connection with the divinity. Mm. Because, you, I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have something sitting around that you didn't think had some way of giving you the, the thing you wanted. So you have a, this kind of pillar and amulet that's going to help you be fertile or help your children survive. Uh, right. Then you're going to people believe... wear crosses all the time to try and ward off or to have luck right. or whatever. Exactly, and you don't think that Jesus is that cross or that God is in that cross, but you think that the symbolic nature of it connects to some power that will that will help. Right, right, and, and so... they rep it does represent the deity in a sense that right. the exactly. God or His angels are gu guarding you or whatever the particular. Yeah, exactly. And so these things are so widespread and and so unknown for the majority of people. Like that, these this is what this is what ancient Israelite religion was, ancient Judaite religion was. They were worshiping the the deities, and and sure they were they were certainly worshiping Yahweh as well. But they had these little things, these little figurines in their homes that were to bring them fertility. And we know at the exact same time that images of Asherah were being erected in the temple beside Yahweh. And so for me, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it seems, you know, there's, there's nothing that's ever cut and dry, I think in this, in this world of textual and, and historical archeological stuff, but that's for me as, as close as you can get. Like we, we have a very clear, a very clear understanding of the way people were imagining their God and their God wasn't a lonely old bachelor up on a throne, just kind of passively watching to see what might happen with his youngins. Like he was, he was their, their powerful warrior God who would challenge the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah in on the on Mount Carmel when Elijah went there and God would would pick fights and was mm -hmm. you know he was involved in stuff and that's how they pictured him and he had a wife and so then like then the question that you asked is like well did they get a divorce i guess that is the really good question like how do we end up without without Asherah, because wouldn't things be a lot easier then? Like, because then it could be Ash Asherah and God made made uh, Savior and sent them. I don't know. There's all sorts of questions. And in fact, before we get to something where you and me are going to go further, I just yep. shamelessly, shamelessly want to plug you again while we have 402 people here like this. Oh. So that oh. everyone can see God's wife, number one. And the algorithm says, hey, this video is amazing. I'm glad. Let's send more people because people get recognized and then they come and check us out. But also, also subscribe to da Dr. Matthew Munger's YouTube channel. While you're here, he's got some amazing stuff. We are at the end of the stream. You got to stay tuned. 4.57K subscribers right now. I want to blow those numbers out of the water. I want to try and get to five. 
Let's see if we can make the magic happen. So um, maybe maybe you impress me and blow me away and be like, oh, wow. So Dr. Munger, this isn't more, this is not what academics do usually, the conversation I'm bringing this into. Okay. Academics do what you just did. But this is more internet youtube world stuff that scholars sometimes engage with. Some scholars don't want to. You've gone on record last time saying that you are no longer a believer in Christianity. This, what I'm looking at, what you just described today, makes me go, wow, this looks like the same typical, the typical Isis and Osiris or whatever pantheon and Canaan, you name it, just very mundane human religion development. This God is no different at this time in history. Eventually, we know he becomes the sole solidarity deity, no one beside him, no one compared to him. Um, at least Michael Heiser within the evangelical circles is saying, hey, there's a pantheon here, quit ignoring it, and no, that's not the Trinity in Genesis 1, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> um, and you got to give him kudos where he's right, right? We got to encourage good critical thinking and what's going on. But does this in some way make a huge impact on this God in your view being the real God that later philosophers want to say is this God? Yeah. So, so for me, I think one of the, one of the biggest things about this kind of thing is just that it, um, it flies so in the face of the narrative that is constructed in, in at least the kind of Christianity I was brought up with mm -hmm. that, that says that, you know, there is that one God from eternity and then everything he said in the Bible is true. And then he sends Jesus and like, it, it just, it just, it just flies in the face of that to be, to be able to pick it apart and see that there is like that, that it's actually probably, or not probably, I'll say actually assuredly from, from a historical perspective makes more sense that the Israelite religion was similar to those around them and that their gods behaved in the same ways as those around them. And that what we see is a, a development, a later thing that goes towards this monotheism, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, I, I have no, I, I'm not trying to deny that the, that the Bible moves towards monotheism, I'm not trying to sure. deny that that's an interesting part of Israelite history or Judaite, history, whatever we want to say, Judean. Um, but my, my, like when we leave out the fact that this is, this is, uh, an ancient Near Eastern text that is formed within that context and that the people thought and behaved in completely different ways than a Christian interpretation of the text allows them to, it's, uh, it changes everything. And, and so it's just like, it's, it's, so for me, like, like seriously, like William Deaver's um, methodology of talking about like, cause like his, uh, his subtitle there is archeology span and folk religion in ancient Israel. And it's this idea of folk religion that, and so reading William Deaver's book um, years ago really made a big difference on me, yeah. or made a big impact on me. Um, because of of the fact that it made me question what is uh, what is prescribed post uh, you know post factum uh, commandments that we find in the biblical text that's theologically determined and what would be evidence of the actual practices of normal people if I may to bring up the a modern example I said before we hit record or went live. That is, look at Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses or some modern offshoot that claims to be Christian, but Christianity at large does not claim that they are Christians. Yep. And I want to use that analogy in a modern context to help people connect these dots because I think the ancient elite religion, and let's just say they are the Jehovah's Witnesses, they are the Mormonism of the ancient world, because the common folk would have been the Trinitarian Orthodox creedal position for millennia. And then someone comes along and goes, 
No, that's wrong. Look at the inquisitions. Look at all the stuff. You guys have fallen away from the truth. And we're going to try and bring back reality for whatever reason they want to say. This is how it always should have been. So this is exactly what you see with the modern cults of like Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormonism. Is that a fair analysis of what we're looking at? I'm sure that there is a way in which I'm, it's not the best comparison, but do you yeah. think that there's something to that in what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely. And, and I, I mean, I would say it starts earlier, even like we can look at Islam, right? I mean, so Islam does the exact same thing. It says, I, I, we, we stand in line with all of this, but it's not the same. And so you've gotten it a bit wrong, but you know, and and in Islam accepts the the Torah and the the Gospels, or at least some understanding of them as being something. And Jesus shows up there, and then, but it's like it's but it's not right. Your your understanding of God just isn't right. And so I was doing a thing the other day uh, on on YouTube, and somebody sent a, a chat that was like, "Well, have you considered the Muslim uh, the Muslim picture of Jesus? Because that gets rid of all the problems that you have with the Trinity or whatever." And I'm like, but it 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 doesn't it doesn't fix anything like it, it i'm not looking for a, a solution to whether god is 3 or 1 or 72 or whatever i don't care like that's not that's not what i'm looking for but it's exactly like you said that these things just continue and so you get to the 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 mormonism uh, thing right you get to joseph smith who says oh well i've got a new revelation and and this tells me that that god is like this or you get to again the jehovah's witnesses it's the same thing or i mean honestly it's the same thing with the christian with the christian denominations i would say yeah. that you especially like when you get to the reformation and and martin luther says no god doesn't react like that he, you can't buy your forgiveness from God. This is messed up. So let's right. let's do it different. And then you've got these men, these Anabaptists, the 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 rebaptizers that are like down there going, well, wait a minute, you can't baptize kids because they don't know what's going on. You have to make an active choice. And mm. so they start baptizing each other and saying the church messed that up. So you've got to do it this way if you're going to get saved. And, and like, this is exactly just, what the literature of the Bible, these authors are saying exactly. about the, the folk religion of Israel and, and exactly. how they got into the tough pickle they're in under Assyria. And then, of course, we do see later narratives under Babylon and then Persia comes in and so is that's exactly what you're saying is going on. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that's why you get, I mean, you get, you get reformers in religion that say things are going horribly wrong. We need to change it. Right. So Muhammad does that. That's what, that's what Joseph Smith does. That's what Martin Luther does. That's what, I mean, these, these are things where people come in and say, listen to me. I know what has gone wrong with our generation or why we're in a bad place or why things aren't right. And and I will give us hope, or something better, or whatever. And and then they they interpret and reinterpret the history of everything behind them, and and give new life to it. Look, I, I this is going to sound bold and blunt, but it is what it is. Because I've been vocalizing my position lately, and it's kind of stirred some controversy among people. Because I'm usually just a happy go lucky and live and let live, and I am still that. It's just. Derek, you really think these things? You, you're really speaking about how you feel about these things. I know, because I'm always interviewing people like you and academics, but I've made some, I have drawn some conclusions along the way, and I know there are certain things where I'm like, mm, I think that, but I don't know that, and that's the scholar in me that makes me very hesitant to draw these conclusions. But just being very forthright, this looks extremely man-made to me. And when I make that statement and I hear people n not like that, um, I have to imagine there's some psychological reaction taking place that makes them not like that. It's It looks like the rest of the world religions that do the same thing. In Buddhism, there's reformations. In, in Hinduism, there's reformation. Every world religion does this exact same thing. So... Does that, are you on the, I mean, I don't know if you agree with me. You can disagree with me. I'd love that if you did. It'd make it even more fun, right? But like, it seems very human and not so much like God is actively actually doing these things, unless you want to say this is how God plays the game. 
I mean, but that, yeah, I mean, I think you know me well enough now that know that's, that's my position as well, that, that the, I mean, the, the human imagination and the human ability to, to think and imagine and play games and, and explain what's going on around them is the source of so much great fiction, right? I mean, we, we know this, like that the, the humans write great fiction and, and all we have to do to move from fiction to things written about God is to just accept that humans are also writing that and then we're done. Like there's no other step we have to take. And, and again, this will be the same thing for most people. And this is, I know it's a, it's, it's used in a kind of a sarcastic or mean way sometimes to say like, you know, Christians are atheists of 4,000 gods, but I'm just the atheist of one more, whatever right. Ricky Gervis or whatever says that, or so, you know, people say it, but like, but I think in all honesty, like there's such a clear connection um, or logic to that because like when we read the ancient, the old Norse myths, like I, you know, I'm I, I'm in Norway now, and so you've got like Odin and Thor and things like that. That, like they, they like, okay, there might be some people that take it seriously um, that have have their their still keep that kind of Norse paganism or whatever, but pretty much everybody looks at it as good, interesting, fun stories, and we're really glad that they didn't get burned when the Christians came through. Um, and and the same is basically true for Greek and Roman mythology. Uh, we don't we don't walk around wondering whether or not Zeus and uh, you know Hercules and Athena and all these people were real. We just like the fact that the literature survived and especially when uh, people retell it like which has become really popular these days that people uh, people re are rewriting the old myths and giving us a little more like good language to it. They're super fun. It's great stories. And and it's fiction, but at one point it wasn't. Right? At one point, that was descriptions of what people thought their world was or their divine realm was. Like the Norse mythologies were there to explain why things are the way they are, just like Yahweh is supposed to explain the way things are for the Israelites. It's, and so of course it's human. Like, of course it is. It's humans that imagine what would the gods be like if they exist? What, what makes the sun go? What makes the moon rise? What makes the earth tremble? What makes us exist? Of, yeah. It, just to point out, if I was a believer anymore, I like hearing this about Asherah and his, you know, Yahweh and his Asherah. If, if I were to, try and make a, a case against someone like me today, I'd say that that makes better sense than God alone. We talk about made in his image, right? Well, Genesis says our image, which is plural. So mm. if I were apologetic and trying to like go, listen, actually we, the Mormons were onto something with their reformation. I mean, God has a wife and you will too, and you'll be ruling your own planet, whatever, you know, the, the kind of theology that comes yeah. in. And, and I'd make the case and say, actually, if I were to really try and force this worldview and say, this is true, I'd say we are a reflection of the divine and the divine has, you know, a husband, wife, and, and you have the pantheon and children and all that kind of stuff. That would have been the case that makes better sense than a single deity who's a male deity who's all by himself lonesome in this other realm ruling. Uh, and there's no couple, but you at least have a couple here in Genesis in the garden. So maybe we're a reflection of the divine. However, I think I'm with you that this is more probable that man has made God in his image. And, and we see that that makes the most sense of everything to me. But if I were trying to really make a case for God and why mankind has its kind of certain, uh, I guess you'd say gender roles, the whole nine that we see throughout history, it would be that the divine is a reflection of that. It makes no sense. There isn't a female goddess when we have this only a male dude, like, come on. So if I was making a case, this would be a good one. 
in yeah. my opinion. Well, and and I think, and I, I mean, I love that last point you made. That I mean, it, so we're you know we're making it in the in in its it, we're making God in our image, and so we're we're imagining as time changes, imagining Him in different ways, right? right. And and so like one of the great things a modern parallel is what what is like if, so if you look at the more liberal side of Christianity, like what is what is God now, right? God is love for for most people, and this is like a super important thing in liberal Christianity and in the you know that that God is love, and so like the whole love your neighbor is the most important thing, and then they point out all the things the great things God did that were loving, and say like oh but God loved us so much that He made sacrifices, and God loves us, loves us, love, and and then would look to that, and and like those and those texts are there, right? So we're not. You don't have to deny that the Bible does also talk about God in ways that can be presented as loving, uh, but it does kind of erase all the genocide and the um, like, sacrificing his own son and and the, the the more violent tendencies of God. But what people in you know in more modern liberal contexts want is a loving God, because that is where our culture is kind of moving in the liberal culture is that loving everyone, accepting everyone, being like that. And that's a wonderful thing. Like, I would much rather that we end up with rewriting the Bible in a direction that says God is only love and mm -hmm. don't be mean or bad in any way. Um, I think that would be the absolute best development we could have. But there's something that's changed in culture, too, since the time of, of Yahweh and Asherah. And that's that we live in a book culture where people think that something physical is is in existence and therefore you can't change it and and that is kind of that makes it really hard for theologies to grow and and become i guess you know solidified as something different because back in the day you know say for three four five hundred bc like if if you're you've got new ideas about things you can just write it like you, you can write it down and eventually the old scrolls are going to fall apart and you got new stuff and that might be the only thing that survives. Like you, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not as drastic as now where if you try to, you write a new gospel and say, it's only the God is love. Everybody be like, nope. And, you, and this has been that way since, since the time of Jesus, right? Cause Marcion is the same thing. Like he tries to get rid of all the, all the stuff uh, that's negative and and murder murderous and all that, but he's like people stop him. They're like, oh no no no, bad Martian, don't do that. You make a powerful point about the literature, uh, being a Dead Sea Scroll scholar. So you're dealing with the oldest known material evidence of literature pertaining to the Bible, um, that's scroll related or even parchment related or whatever, and yep. getting behind that, trying to discover. We really are dependent on archaeology to try and help us figure out what was the practice. So constant reformations. Uh, I used this yesterday in my discussion with Kip, and it was the fact that Paula Fredrickson, for example, says Paul's late. You mean our earliest voice to Christianity is late? And who knows what it looked like, whatever Christ-following group there was before him? That's yeah. like this black box we wish we could uncover and hear the voice from. We just don't have it in the same way you're saying with the religious practice of what was going on before the material evidence we have, we're looking at like fragments and fractions of data due to archaeological digs and stuff. But we have good suspicion to say it does not match what the text authors are saying it is. So you can, in my way, this sounds bad, maybe I'm looking at it as here is the propaganda of these elite religious folks trying to impose that and, and it becomes what wins because it's the literature that that kind of wins over history in some way even though there's competition i would say between Enochian and judaism and various other forms of it even jubilees is kind of rewriting genesis etc cetera, etc cetera. like uh, you get where i'm going like this propaganda you can buy it and say hey i'm still practicing judaism hey i'm still a christian hey you know i accept the voice of this minority group of elites to tell me what's accurate if not explain to me why babylon was destroyed then explain to yeah. me why Assyria. it's because they worshiped all these different gods so we don't deny dr munger that you're right that they worship those things but that was wrong and that's why these bad things happened what do you say to that 
and then we'll get to we'll get to Q and A after this. I mean, it, I don't know. I just like there's just so. Many, I don't want to. I don't want to get into it with you because I know that you don't actually mean what you just said. So I know. I know. But, but I, I just have. I, I have such a problem with the. Um, with the adoptionism, uh, and the idea that see, so the, 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 so the problem is that, that Christianity appropriates the, the God of Israel and claims the promises that come in the old Testament as their own. Right. And so uh, that, that already is, is a massively problematic thing that where we kind of change the idea of God's chosen people from being God's chosen people, which is in the old Testament to being God's chosen those who agree with us, right? And so the like the people goes from being the ethnic group to being the the people that agree with Paul, um, and and so that is like this. It, it, and then to say that the God of Israel is then the God of every single Christian, and then to get into this whole thing like you you bring up, it just makes me like my head makes my head spin, you know, <laughs> because. Because it, there's no, but there's just so much, there's just so much, uh, so, so many weird, um, there's just so many weird dynamics because people like, like literally like will argue that, that Christians are the only right way to interpret the old Testament and that, that Israel missed their chance. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, I mean, it's just, that that's just horrible. Like, it's just, I'm sorry. It's just like such a strange thing to need to be your your hill to die on that that you and and this this group of people that decided that the god of these people would send a savior for those people but now we who aren't those people are going to decide that he's only for us and he's not for them because they didn't accept it All right, end of show, everybody. Now, for <laughs> oh, right. wow, um, you have a way about you when you talk, Matt, that is very clear, and it makes a lot of sense. And this, I hope, I, I look, we're preaching to the choir. Many people in the chat, most I'm sure, agree with what we're saying and think the way that we do. And then there, there, there are those who may not agree with our conclusions, and I respect that. I do. I really do. Um, at the end of the day, I hope they respect the same and they understand like, he's got a point that makes sense. I can't knock them for thinking this doesn't seem true and they may hold on for whatever reason it is. I had one guy tell me he's a Christian. I'm not going to mention their name. They're a scholar PhD. And they told me Jesus failed, like his apocalyptic expectations failed. And I said, well, why are you, if you I stop the recording, I said, can I ask you something personal? Like, why are you still a Christian? And they were just like, I, I like the the church. I like, I like the, uh, you know, the setting and, and the, the organization of it and stuff. And I'm like, nowhere did they have like a, well, he died and rose on the third day. And that is absolutely why. And it's so true. Um, and that was totally like interesting hearing him say that. So there's like, there's no animosity with that. There are some that run around. And they have they are the bearers of truth, and this literature is right. And if you don't believe it, you know what the repercussions are and such. And they're the ones who read these voices from this literature that you have absorbed and literally broken down in its scribal form on fragments in the Dead Sea in its most primitive state that we have. And you're looking at it going, mm, yeah, I'm not, I don't like I'm obviously don't believe it, but you love it. You love it. And they're just, they're buying what they're being told. So there's a sense to me where I think people want to believe, like yeah, you, you sure. talked about earlier, we want things to be true, even if they necessarily aren't. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, it's, like I said, I, I, I have no problem with, with people choosing to, to use that as their lens for, for viewing the world. And, and I'm very clear about that, that I read things uh, in, uh, from a historical perspective and I'm interested in what the things uh, reflect of 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 historical realities. And so if people want to say nope, the Bible says that Jesus rose from the dead and so I believe that 
And the Bible says that all these uh, things are are bad. They're false. They're false gods or whatever. And and that that's fine. Like they that's perfectly fine. People can can choose to live like that, and that's exactly. fine. And 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 hopefully they then will use that knowledge to to be kind and generous with others and accepting and and loving. I hope that's the reading they have. Because mm -hmm. I see a lot of really mean stuff. Like, I mean, I, I tell you, man, I've just starting a YouTube channel was probably the the worst thing I could have done for for my my feeling of whether or not people are good. Because the amount of stuff that people write to me um, and the way people attack is so surprising to me. Um, because it's not. Uh, it's. I mean, it's. It's everyone. Anyone who is who is angry, attacking, vindictive is, is doing it in the name of God. Um, and, and the amount of private messages I get, the amount of stuff where people need to tell me, um, how horrible I am, you know, and stuff like yeah. that it, in the name of God and Jesus, it's just so surprising. Um, because the, like that, that's not helpful. You know, it's like, that's not, that's not nudging me back into the fold of God or whatever. Yeah. Um, but the but like when we look at it from the perspective of asking what were historical realities or how close can we get to historical realities, which is what I'm interested in, then then things just look different. And so for me, like there's there's a million reasons why I wouldn't want to you know become a, a Christian again or whatever. But like the 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 Bible is just like one of them. It's just that it's not from a historical perspective, not convincing that these things logically lead to the conclusions that, uh, that the Christian community reaches. I want to say, <clears throat> sorry that you have to deal with that. I've been dealing with that for several years with this YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, in fact, I, I think a lot of people, and I, I, I know they mean well, the ones that are like, get thicker skin, Derek. Don't let the people bother you. Yesterday's video about saying they're calling me a lying or a liar. I've been called that for several years. I'm vocalizing to show what goes on that people don't see. And I do it not because it's, look, I've been called this forever. I really want to show and explain what the heck is going on with my yesterday video. For example, yeah. uh, this is war video, you know, all that. And I've been getting that for, like I said, a long time. And I'm simply pointing out, like, look at the Christian channels. They have the same apologetic spin, the same Christian scholars that are going to push their point of view. And Myth Vision doesn't play that game. We aren't interested in, here's our conclusion, we're going to prove it now. You know, that's what I see happening personally. I'm interested yeah. oh, in, yeah. No, I was just going to say, and like, and and it's perfectly understandable that that uh, that people have different perspectives, and their YouTube channels are different. Like, so I don't. I mean, I'm I'm not going to be doing any anything that's that I feel is like anti whatever that's inflammatory on my channel because I'm not interested in that. Like, I just want to walk through texts from a scholarly perspective, and I'm interested in 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 doing that. And and I, I I see what you do is giving giving air to uh, to scholars and to scholarly perspectives that aren't coming through on a dogmatic or or uh, you know kind of confessional style channels and I think that's also perfectly a fair fair game and and so it's just uh, it's it's just so so surprising to me that 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 is. I, or let me say it differently. I think that I've spent so long in the in the academic world that I'm used to that kind of like when you when you do something and somebody doesn't agree, like okay, of course you have sometimes that people say things really boldly and say like you're an idiot, whatever. But like normally it's just like they just write an article where they argue it better from a different perspective, and then you're like, oh, okay, well I didn't see that the first time around, and then mm -hmm. things progress. And so I'm happy to change my academic views all the time because when new evidence comes to light, new interpretations come, then we're we're good to go. And like you might have a fierce interaction. Like I had this in uh, what was that? Six months ago, I was at a conference and I I said some stuff that provoked some of my colleagues at, at the conference, and uh, and they um, 
uh, it was it was on the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I was just making some uh, a case for for ways we deal with text and things like that. And there was some really fierce discussion. Like I got a lot of pushback, and like to the point where somebody came up to me afterwards and was like, "Man, that was rough." And I was like, "Yeah, it's fine." <laughs> and then we all went out and had a beer, and and it was fine. And we just and and you can do that. But like the the I think the people that uh, I'm interacting with now or that are interacting with me, I'm not really interacting with them. Um, those aren't the kind of people that that I would sit down and have a beer with, you know. Right. And so you get kind of used to this. It's it, but it's such a good thing to to at least make available knowledge. I think that's one of the most important things for me. Knowledge should be available. And I'm if you're you. rejecting any type of knowledge just because it belongs to a certain uh, group, like I, I think that's gonna gonna lead to more problems. Amen. Amen. Uh, one, I want to leave a, a thing of encouragement for you, but also the audience mainly because I, what can happen is when we speak on something, it can, it can stir up the crowds and then it can create animosity that I don't want there. Yes. I do think there's some, honestly, there's, I'll use the word troll, but that, that's, that could be synonymous with derogatory terms for people that I'm not trying to, you know, go out down that path. I'm, I'm there are several we have real trolls here. So yeah, but I want to, I just want to leave something positive. There are several people who identify as Christian believers, whatever their position might be. They can be Muslims. They can be Jews. Doesn't matter their ontology that have wrote me and said, you're doing the work of God, man. I don't, I don't care. Like I get, I don't follow you to your conclusion, but man, that historical research is way better than anything I've ever heard from any apologetic channel from any Christian channel I've ever seen. Keep doing what you're doing, Derek. Don't let the haters get to you. And I want to give you that message too, just brother to brother, because like it's super discouraging if you allow it to be. Seven years ago when I first got clean off heroin, I did a, a recovery channel. I had several comments at first. I did not know what was the YouTube world. Like yeah. people wished I was dead, right? Like I got used to people saying, you're a worthless junkie addict who deserves to die. And- like, yeah. then I had other comments that were like, you saved my life. Your words and you documenting what you've done, you have saved my life. Please never stop. The same happens here. You have the haters. You have the people that are going to be triggered. They're upset. They're scared. I think it's a defense mechanism for the most part because what you're doing, they have connected and identified with that worldview so much that to attack the worldview is like attacking their parent, attacking someone they love. So their reacting is really just fear. And so I'm like just – I laying the, the whole thing out because it can be discouraging, but you just thick in your skin and just know that reaction, it's speaking more than what they're saying at you about them than what the reality is. So that's my personal two cents. I'm here to learn from you, but I hope that encourages you not to give up on your YouTube yeah. channel because oh, people yeah. need you. People want you out here. People want to learn from you. Speaking of which, and I would love to have you comment, subscribe to Dr. Munger's YouTube channel. Go give him positive comments. We're going to refresh this at the end, everybody. We're going to see how many subscribers he's grown just from this stream alone. And of course, over the next few days, he's going to be messaging me going, wow, wow, wow. Look, we got some people who support. Show him positive love in the comment section to drown out the negativity. Anyway, did you want to comment on that before we start Super Chats? No, thanks. I just appreciate I appreciate it. I know you get a lot of stuff thrown at you and yeah. and um yeah, I, I don't read your comment sections either because there's so much. Uh, so much stuff My wife gets so defensive. My wife, yeah. I'd punch them in the face right now if they, yeah. you know, because it's really, really yeah. dark stuff. And yeah. these oftentimes yeah. are people in the name of God, but there are some, believe it or not, that aren't. And you, you almost go like, is this some radical, extreme atheist person who – who who has some conspiracy theories about something or whatever yeah, it's really yeah, odd it's, it's hard to know the internet yeah. has all sorts of stuff on it so yeah thank you everybody in the chat like the video right now we're going to super chats and i'm going to drop the banner so you can actually see us but feel free to super chat your questions and i'm going to the tippy like the video let the algorithm gods pay attention to us maybe ashra is one of the pantheon within the algorithm of youtube who knows 
Uh, <laughs> let's get up here. It's taking me a second to scroll up because we had a lot of chat so far today. Almost 500 people watching, uh, Matt. Nice. Yeah. It's I think we good for a Thursday. Right. It is. Again, Miss J, thank you for becoming a member or renewing your membership. It uh, always means a lot to see the family we are building here and educating the world. You're helping make that happen. Seriously, that thank Mrs. you. That's Mrs. Yahweh. The, Mrs. You know, the, the J the J source. <laughs> the J source. Definitely not the L source. Like not with the uh dealing with Elohim. Uh Christine yeah. Elise, uh, I think I'm saying your last name properly. Thank you for the super chat. Scrolling down. Our areas, super sticker. People are just nice. showing love today. They're not making you work. <laughs> yeah. Jim Johnson with the super sticker. Thank you so much. Let's get down here to the next one. Oh, we got our first question, I think it is. This was your life. What do you say to apologists who say this information was just corrupted over time and El Elyon was always Yahweh? They never worshipped El but Adonai. I mean, it just... I, I, I don't, I, it just doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry. I, I, I get the question. I agree. Like, so what would you say? Okay. I would say, but why on earth does the Bible again and again use different names? Why does it in Exodus, uh, Exodus chapter six, why does it say to uh, your name by the name El Elyon, I was, I was known to the patriarchs, but now you'll know me as, as Adonai or as Yahweh. Like, why does it, why does it have to do that? Oh, it has to do that because they're making sure that everybody knows, Oh, anytime you hear anything about El or El Elyon or El Shaddai, that they really, it meant Yahweh, but because they were talking about other gods. And, and so it's just like, it's, I, I think that, I mean, I would love for an apologist to give me this argument, actually, because they're saying it was corrupted over time. Like, if an apologist is using the thing that the Bible's corrupted over time and leaves these uh, El and El Yon and El Shaddai things in there, then, wow, that's, then they've accepted a more real picture of the Bible. But it's <laughs> it's just because the, 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 the development is just so clear. I mean, there's, you have all these different names and that's fine. You can... If you want to imagine them as always being one person, that's fine. You can imagine them that way. But that's, you know, the texts use these completely different names. It's just the way it is. Thank you for answering. Thank you for the super chat. Seeker 206, isn't the polytheism of Israel acknowledged and condemned repeatedly in the biblical text themselves? Right. And that's my point. Um, so my point is that the, the biblical texts themselves are written backwards. So they are looking backwards from a situation where they're saying we messed up and we got destroyed. What was the cause of this? And they say, oh, well, we should have been faithful to one God and only one God. And then whoosh, here comes the covenant in the form of the book of Deuteronomy that we should have followed. And then they rewrite the entire, or write the entire history saying, this is where every little step went wrong, where every God was done, was worshiped that shouldn't have been, or where God wasn't worshiped when he should have been. And this is acknowledging the polytheism and, and condemning it. But it's the, the point is that that's done from one single perspective after the destruction of, of Israel and Judah, where then they're trying to figure out why it went wrong. And so, Makes yes, I agree. Is, you're, you're exactly right, Seeker 206. It is repeatedly acknowledged. And, and the, but the point of the matter is that that was the reality that wasn't problematic for 99.9% .9 of the people ever. And it's only after the Babylonian exile that it becomes the standard thinking that, oh, we, we, we need to avoid all these things for everyone. Another way of me getting in and in, in addressing the question that is being asked and assuming it's a modern voice that's trying to say, this is how I'm seeing the question kind of can, can be used for an apologist is, but yeah, 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 they said that was wrong. I, I, I believe their voices. And what you're trying to point out is sure, and yeah, you can accept their voices, but that's not the whole picture. And in fact, there's a much larger picture that is ignored because all you have is those voices. Like we don't have the voices of competing, probably competing priestly sex. 
and what they thought about multiple deities. We only have these texts that are somehow giving clout. And because of that, you just believe what you read. It's like what I said the other day on a video about Paul. Paul says, it's me, Paul. I do not lie. I tell you the truth. And of course, I was being sarcastic on April 1st and saying like, whoever says they don't lie and lies. Nobody says I'm not lying and they're actually lying. My point is, is you, the reader, the believer sees Paul and it doesn't necessarily have to be the believer. Some people might accept that he's not lying. Maybe he really isn't lying, but you just believe he's not lying because he said he's not lying. Like, how do you know he's not lying? How do you know yeah. these authors are actually being honest and true and what they're saying is accurate? You don't. You just accept what they're saying is accurate and true. And so it's a very complicated thing, but that – I wanted to dive deeper on that if that was okay with you, yeah. Matt. Oh, yeah. But then there's two things. Like one one response to what you said at the end is just like I loved what happened. Um, I mean, it's it's years ago now that the Da Vinci Code came out by, by Dan Brown. But he wrote in the beginning of the Da Vinci Code, right at the very beginning, he says, everything in this book is true. Right? right? Everything in this book is true. And that made a bunch of Christians lose their shit. Like because <laughs> – because, Obviously, it wasn't in line with the established understanding of church history, and it talked about all these different things and the Knights Templar and all this kind of stuff. And, and there were literally books written debunking the Da Vinci Code because Dan Brown said everything here is true. And then they asked him, like, well, how, how can it all be true? And he's like, well, it just is. And, and like, he was so cool about it because like, it's obviously not true. Like everybody yeah. knows yeah. that the Da Vinci Code is a work of fiction, but it just made people be like, oh, it has to, I have to prove it wrong. I have to, you know, and they're like, yeah. it's, and so the, the, the base of reality is just different. But then the other thing I wanted to say is like, you know, when, when you say things like, oh, well, the, the text says it that way. And that's the only thing we have, right? That's all we have. Well, that's not all we have. We have to learn to interpret archaeological and historical data to help us understand the way things were. And that's a different source. And that source says something completely different than what the texts are saying sometimes. And then we have to weigh those things up against each other and ask, what do we want to listen to? Do we want to listen to historical data or do we want to take the, take the word of, of the text? And that is a, a, a negotiation that historical scholars do, is to look mm -hmm. at the data that we have through comparative and archaeological things, by social history, by things like that, um, anthropology, and, and then compare it to the texts we have, and then work with the texts in ways that help us to understand what they reflect. And so we're not without other sources. It's just that those other sources often contradict what the right. Bible is saying. So well put, and there might be, you know, you can find multiple authors in the Bible that support this priestly elite uh, right. perception. But I was thinking about the flood just a moment in this, and it's like, why did the great flood happen? The Bible tells right. you the wickedness of man and the really, you could almost say the procreation of this deity yep. with, with mortal women and such, uh, deities with mortal women. And look at the wickedness and corruptness. But then you go to the, the myth it borrows from, and it's actually antagonistic toward. And you go, well, actually, in one of those cases, the gods wouldn't shut up. So the god ends up wanting to destroy the gods. The, in the other case, it's humans won't shut up. So they want to flood the human. So what? why did the flood happen? Depends on who you read and where you're getting your information from. Right. And all of them can be wrong. You could yeah. argue one of them's true. Or you could say, this is great storytelling. There's all sorts of stuff. So thank you for that. Imnag, Dr. Matthew, is there any knowledge of the origins of Yahweh? Could it have Egyptian influence? So the, I mean, the, the knowledge that we have of the, of the origin of, of Yahweh is very scant. Like we don't, we don't have a lot of stuff. We have these couple of inscriptions that are, that are, fairly early from the, they are from the Northern Sinai. And so it's very possible that there's some Egyptian influence on that. We also have, I mean, the, the oldest inscriptions we have in Semitic are also from this area, from the Sinai uh, area. And so 
it's it's perfectly reasonable that Yahweh was was connected to to worship in that area and and developed as a as kind of a more of a local tribal god that that was you know kind of brought into the Israelite uh, connection and and whether there's Egyptian influence I mean of 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 course there's there's like there's possibilities for Egyptian influence and for Assyrian Babylonian Hittite um, influence on on everything during this period so it's it's it would be surprising if there wasn't influence is is the way i look at it it's almost like i imagine even in the larger empires there's probably influence of egyptian ideas into theirs and theirs into it's like even those massive areas probably have influence from each other yeah. especially the small little communities sandwiched and controlled in between yeah for sure for sure my one black friend, good to see you here. Hello, everyone. Check out Exodus twenty two twenty eight. Thou shalt not revile the gods nor curse the ruler of thy people. How about that? How about that? Um, so uh, the, I mean, when you look at it, it's it's a weird, it's a really weird uh, verse, and the, <laughs> I mean. It see what what that comes up in is is a part of the of the law that just kind of gives a lot of a lot of random things, but that are very connected to other ancient Near Eastern uh, law codes. And so, I mean, when you read the re read the law right after it, I just want to I'll just I'll just read it from from my thing here. Okay. But like, so, so you read this, and it says. Um, uh, let's see. So 28 is there. So the the if you read for, if I read from verse 25 it says if you lend money to my people to the poor among you you should not deal with them as a creditor you should not extract in interest from them. Okay. So this is that interest thing. You can't take interest from fair, fellow Israelites. If you take your neighbor's cloak as a pawn you shall restore it to the when the sun goes down and for if you if for it may be your neighbor's only clothing and blah 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 and then so then we get this and you shall not revile god or curse a leader of your people um and okay that's that's fine and then you shall not delay to make offerings from the fullness of your harvest to the outflow of your presses the firstborn of your sons you shall give to me yeah again <laughs> right um and so it's it's a really um yeah, it's it's just a set of laws here or, or of regulations that are probably just collected from other other sources or they've brought in that these are things that are are thrown together and they have a, a kind of random character to them. And you've got things that cover, you know, you cover slaves and you cover lending and you cover prayer and you cover offerings. And it's just like um yeah, it's it's just a very a very strange thing and then that's the translation too so i noticed that that he has put on there um the translation that gods so it, it translates elohim as gods in the plural uh where others will translate it as as god like as as but the word for gods there is elohim and so it's kind of hard to know um whether or not that was uh, uh yeah what was intended uh what was intended with that verse Right, because right. if you do take it plural, then in a sense, they're they're obviously saying the chief deity is the one they worship, which would be El or Yahweh at this time. Um, but it would just be like, don't be disrespectful to the other deities. Uh, but um, that would it wouldn't be saying worship them, but necessarily like don't don't uh, don't go out of your way to revile them. It would seem. But if you take this as one and just talk about the God of them, right? I mean, there's probably various ways to interpret this, but what, what would you say if it's if it's plural? Am I on the right track with that? Yeah, I mean, so it, I guess it, yeah, again, it's it's just the question of uh, of what, how you want to read it, right? So if you read uh, that, you should you shouldn't. I mean, really, the word. Um, so I just I mean, looking at it in in Hebrew and the. Um, the word that's there is the word to 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 curse, really. Um, so like you you shouldn't you shouldn't curse God, um, and and so that's I mean it. I don't think that's a very problematic statement. Um, if you read it as a if you read Elohim as the God of Israel, so it makes sense in the Bible like that. 
but if you want to read it as a plural, then you shouldn't curse the gods. Then that's you know it's interesting. But the, this is the big problem with having a one a word for one individual god that also happens to be the plural for the <laughs> many gods. It's just kind of it can get really uncertain. Thank you so much, my friend. Our areas again. Thank you for the super. Oh, did I miss one at the top? I hope I didn't miss the super sticker at the top. But okay, so thank you. Didn't the fertility gods like Asherah and Baal uh, Baals require child sacrifice as well? Forerunner of Yahweh sacrificing his son. Yeah. So there, there are some texts that uh, that do point to Asherah and Baal requiring sacrifices, and and we also have that in the Hebrew Bible. So it's, I mean, it's already. There, we just read one actually. I mean, that uh, it's in, in Exodus 22, uh, where it says, uh, The firstborn of your sons you should give to me. Um, it's, I mean, we can, we can <laughs> say, Oh, well, he meant give in the way of become a priest or do like go, go into youth with a mission and serve God, and you'll be the you, you know, the near holy, or you know, but uh, it's. In a in a sacrifice culture, give the firstborn of your lambs, give the first fruits of your harvest, give your firstborn son. It's sounds like sacrifice. That's the closest clear connection, rather than oh, when we get to the human, we don't mean it's different yeah. now. Let's yeah. yeah, got it. But obviously, and then of course, when we get to the to the text that say, and by the way, you can you can buy uh, a, a free pass, so you don't actually have to kill your kid. You know, we because we get that They're like yeah. There's and here's how much it costs to redeem your your child so that you don't have to kill it. Um, so we, you know, it's it's there. Yeah. Hmm. There's so much in that topic too. I'm hoping to get Francesca Stavrakopoulou on about her dissertation, which is actually on human sacrifice and yeah. in ancient Israel. And I want to do an episode on that because we've done God and anatomy twice, covering different yeah. things, but. I really want to get into human sacrifice, especially as well spoken as she is. So, uh, don't worry. A, huh? Nobody makes. A, I hope nobody makes a clip of that. I really want to get into human sacrifice. Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get into human sacrifice, but I do. Ooh, um, no, she's so well spoken. Uh, trust yeah. me, I'm trying. I've been emailing, so it's very difficult. Yep. She's a busy, busy person. So uh, I know she'll respond at some point. Pansy Pot, can we detect traces of Asherah in the Hebrew Bible? Yes. So the, I mean, so we, this is kind of where we started out, but the, um, there are 40 verses where the word Asherah is used, uh, sometimes in the singular, sometimes in the plural. And the, um, the majority of these are connected to the the poles, the the actual Asherah poles that would have been put up as a place of a, a distinguishing thing for the place of worship of Asherah, but in several places also the it's it's the name of the of the goddess uh, Asherah that's that's actually there in the text, and so we um, like we saw in the in the the setting up of an of a graven image of Asherah in the temple in uh in second kings is kind of the best uh the best one but there are also a number of other places where where asherah is is definitely mentioned by name in the bible i know there's one academic i was um watching religion for breakfast channel that it's a it's a lady scholar who actually tried to argue it's purely this poll thing but um you are saying there's a correlation between the poll and the deity and that like it's, I think Deaver does the same, but, um, but how could it not be like you? I mean, I, the, for me, I, so I think Deaver has a, has a quote. I think I even wrote it down because I was so like, I think it's such a good quote. Wait a minute. In his book. Uh, uh, yes. I, I found it. Um, so he, um, he says, you know, because, because people don't, you know, don't want to accept this, you know, don't want to read it like, that and he it's it's in his conclusion i think and he writes i find i find that rather desperate and i suspect that it reflects the reluctance of many biblical scholars to even consider the possibility that yahweh may have had a female consort mm. and it's like it's that exact feeling that the reluctance of accepting that the poles are that the word for pole is asherah and that the pole then was connected to the worship of asherah 
If that's hard to accept, then it's only because you don't want to talk about the worship of Asherah in the Bible. Like there's, there's exactly. not, an, there's, there's not an, there, there's no reason when we have a goddess named Asherah that's reflected in other Canaanite contexts that it's reflected in the, in the lands around it's even mentioned in the Bible. And then we have these poles that are told that are mentioned as places of worship of something that need to be torn down and they're called Asherahs. Like, why wouldn't it be that? Like, I think, I think everybody out there listening to is sees that probably like when you, when you, when you explain it like that, that these things that are called sacred poles or whatever in the Bible, like the word is Asherah. That's it. Well put. I, I think the same could be said about like Yahweh figurines or standing stones for Yahweh right. or something. The right. same and resistance. The things that, yeah. Sorry. Now I'm interrupting you. <laughs> no, no. I look, I want you to, I want to learn from you, man. No, but I'm just saying, because I, I mean, and that's my point is that like we we see this in in some of the details in the Bible, but when you move to archaeology and to social history, you see it even broader. And so by by like by going into these details and finding these traces of of Asherah in the in the Hebrew Bible, then it it helps us to accept what we find in archaeology as reflecting social realities. And not just being, uh, you know, anomalies from from what we think the Bible is trying to say. Wow. Thank you. And trust me, butt in because I never <laughs> am offended. <laughs> uh, Dr. Cheryl, in the myth of Genesis one twenty six, do you think the word u- usage us included Asherah? Hi, Dr. Cheryl. Um, <laughs> I so I I like it. I I wish that there was reason to say it, but I don't, I don't, I don't know that we can make that argument. Um, so the, I mean, the traditional argument or the traditional, traditional line of thinking is that we're talking about the, the pantheon or the, the, you know, this is the council of the gods or whatever that, that is in the us in, in Genesis 126. And so then I guess Asher would be included in that, but there's, there's not, a uh, like there's no convincing reconstruction of what the Israelite pantheon would have looked like that I would feel like comfortable with uh, with supporting or anything like that. I think the it it still is a mystery that the word that the that the plurals are used that the we and the us is used because it is it would have been so easy to fix if you were writing that like you you didn't have to do it like that and so. The who is it? Whether that it really is just a, a a leftover trace of the Babylonian influence, um, or whether it's uh, actually imagining an Israelite panthe- pantheon or a, or a, you know divine council, I don't know. But if it that is what it is, then I think probably Asher is there at, at his side. But it there's just so many what ifs about it that I I don't yeah. I don't know. Well, great question, and uh, thank you for that, Cheryl. Rama, Haraya, I hope I'm saying that, Haraya. Storytelling for humans in general seems more impactful than just facts. Do humans need better stories to outgrow our dependency on religion or meaning? Do we need? Wow. Well, I mean, um, obviously, we our stories convey meaning, and this is why if we're defining truth as, like, meaning, well, then you can find truth almost anywhere. And, uh, uh, nobody does that better than Peterson, Jordan Peterson. Yeah, he can read anything and squeeze something out of it. And it's like, yeah. go no, and destroy I, all the Amalekites. And, yeah, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, but I think, I think the underlying point of this question is really good that, that, um, I mean this, so this, this kind of goes back to the ancient Greek philosophy, I would almost say, like the so the like the the kind of Plato and the and the Platonists and 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 Aristotle and everybody they were they they didn't like the sophists because the sophists were were rhetoricians and they could convince people um, of things just by being good at talking and that was like they they would they would sell themselves for hire and would argue something and use good rhetoric and good storytelling I would say to 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 win an argument. And, and what the, you know, the opponents of them would say was that this is, 
this is just bad philosophy. It's really bad if you win an argument because you're a good rhetorician and not uh, not actually telling the truth or giving the best arguments. And and so, but I think that it's it's a very illustrative point that what we're what we're dealing with when we when we read stories is not necessarily um, the truth, but it's it's emotion or it's uh, feeling or it's it's engagement or something and stories don't have to be true to be convincing or to be exciting or to make you feel something. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that, but I think it's a, it's a, an awareness of that is a pretty important thing, whether or not we need to outgrow things. I don't know if we can outgrow the fact that we are engaged better, more by stories than we are by, you know, rote facts, but it's, yeah, interesting. Maybe we should marry the two in some way yeah. and re yeah. re tell the stories but with fact-based realities i don't know and be willing to change them as evidence comes in imnag thank you so much for that super chat isn't that exactly the problem making god like us just opens the door to also claim that my people are special we made him it's for us and our people not sure if i'm making my point it's like it's almost like you brought up the nordic uh the the norse mythology I can't imagine they didn't see themselves as chosen in some way uh, by their deity. Yeah. It's like the Greeks, the Athenians especially, were big. They were kind of xenophobic. And they thought, we descended directly from this deity. Yahweh, in a sense, becomes the adopting god of the Israelite people in their perception, especially by the first century. So it's like, we're his chosen Everyone else is not, and that chosenness has created bigotry and all sorts of problems in the world amongst various religions. It's not just the Abrahamic ones. So I think that's what they're trying to say, but... Yeah, well, and I think it's just, I mean, the point is it's a circular thing, right? That, that I mean, people imagine God in their image and imagine their God having the values and the, and the whatever, the, the systems that they have. And then they can use that to then tell other people that no, no, our God supports us in the way we are and the way we do things. And mm -hmm. and I think that's that's exactly the point I was trying to make about about modern Christianity as well. That, that this is just a pretty common thing that you you see the values you have, the social values you have in God. And so then people that are against a certain thing that they see in society will then be able to find that support for that in their Bible. People that are in favor of something will find that same uh, it, that same support in their Bible. And those two can go head to head saying, no, no, God is like this. No, God is like that. And they're both using the exact same Bible and almost identical texts to make the same exact point. <laughs> but But what they're finding is they're finding their God and then they're arguing that their God is on their side. This is amazing. Thank you. Great response. Vane, thank you so much for becoming a member today. Um, this has been a heck of a stream. I'm having a hoot. I hope you're enjoying yourself, Matt. Oh, yeah. JC, learning from Dr. Munger and Myth Vision Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I was lucky to be raised secular, but religious studies are fascinating as cultural stories. I hope Dr. Munger can let us uh, guilt go or let can let guilt go. Stephen Hassan has good advice. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. I think he, I think they're also talking about what we mentioned earlier about people yeah. talking to you. So, so. Thank you, JC. Yeah. I'm scrolling down, going down, down, down. And way down we go. Here we go. Oh, there's that guy named Pat. Oh, snap. Oh. Stop all this scholarship. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Flow over me. It's Holy pretty. Spirit. It's pretty heavy, Pat. I, uh, I'm yeah. trying to resist it right now. Yeah. Thank you for showing I mean, for up. Two, Pat. For two dollars, you know. I mean, he. If he was serious, he would have given you at least twenty. Duh. Thinking. Every yeah. church-going person knows that the more money, the more clout you have in that congregation. <sighs> T.W. Thank you so much for that super chat. Um. You didn't have a question. Thank you for the support. Brilliant Beaches says, P52, 5,600 early manuscripts. Name one about Caesar. P52, I think this is about John, right? The, the, this is that right. fragment on the so, Gospel of John. So I think Brilliant Peaches is trying to say that, that there is manuscript evidence of the Gospel of John from within... 150 years of Jesus 
And so I guess that's, I don't know what it's an argument for. Um, but anyway, and so I, I don't have a problem with problematizing any texts about Caesar or Homer or Plato or Aristotle or Alexander the Great or any other uh, person in history. I think everything needs to be read from with the same level of criticism. And I'm a manuscript scholar, and so my my entire life is built around asking these questions of what manuscripts do we actually have for things? And so I I don't find it convincing to have that kind of thing thrown about because I don't care um, about the the. But but then I just want to make one more point is that fifty five thousand six hundred early manuscripts. Then you don't know what you have because uh, the word manuscripts gets thrown around a lot and people tend to think that you have entire copies of the Bible or something. No, you might have a couple of scraps with a couple of verses that we that we can't connect. You might have a, in some cases you have a whole a whole page. In some cases then once you get up into the into the fourth century, then you're getting entire texts, entire Bibles, things like that. Is that what you call early? Like is mm -hmm. so what, what are we calling early? But the the vast majority of things are small, exerted, or quotations in the church fathers that are just happen to be also called early manuscripts. And so we I, I don't know what the argument would be if, if you're trying I to say I think I know. That's what I was that, gonna say. That, I think I know. Yeah, go on. I recently made a remark about the birth narrative in Suetonius, the portents leading up to Caesar Augustus, just one Caesar. By the way, there are several Caesars who have divine births with portents and miracles and and really miraculous claims that are attributed to them. Um, I think what they're trying to say is name an early manuscript that talks about Caesar in some divine way. This might be a Christian apologist. I could be mistaken here. I might be reading into this, but I, I say that because they're saying look at early manuscripts. But I want to make something just to remind people. The Roman Roman Empire collapses and Christianity becomes the main religion that Christians themselves are the ones having to preserve the history here. So it's like imagine finding an empire that was once the thing like Assyria, Assyria and then you find – Later on in the 7th, 8th century, a different model that they worship a different deity or something happens. Um, it's really, did they preserve anything or not? Somehow preservation proves validity. Why not become a Muslim? Because they have great preservation of the Quran. Like, who, you know, this is the kind of argument, and if that's what well, I'm reading into it. Yeah, but, and, and that's how, that's how I, 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 I don't know. If, if that's what it is, then then whatever like because i i would never make an argument that you have to believe in caesar for anything yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so that's my and that's my point that I, I don't i don't see what the point is because what i want is to be able to work with things historically and and i agree that i'm not going to go out asking people to devote their lives to caesar right um i'm not going to ask anyone to devote their life to alexander the great I'm not going to ask anyone to change the way they live for Ashurbanipal. And so I, and I'm also not going to value then how I should act or be based on those things. Um, so I, I, I don't see it as being any problem. Like I would like to know more about the historical realities of Julius Caesar if we had it. I would like to know more about the realities of first century Palestine and, and sure. Jesus as well. But so we, so do I. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't I, like, I think we agree. Like, I'd want to know more about Paul. I'd want to know more about the early church. I'd like to know about Jesus. I'd love to know more about the Caesars. And I think the more we see and know, I think that it'll fill in a lot of a picture of what, what's going on here. And I think that it'll just help us. I think one of the things that makes it so, um, successful is the unfalsifiability again of many things, I think. Uh, and, and I'm not saying that some things can't be falsified, but there's a mystery uh, that we don't know exactly how the whole starting of some things happened. And so yeah. when you have a black box, it's almost like, how did the universe come to be? <laughs> there's yeah. only one explanation. It's my yeah. God. And, you know? and it's just that, that if you, if, if people are really out there um, arguing that, because something's written in a text, it has to be true. 
then then it i mean then it doesn't matter what we're what, what you're gonna say like i mean so, like because that's my thing is like i don't care i don't care if you have a first century copy of each of the gospels it doesn't mean it's true like there's and and so there's like even preservation great show me show me the manuscripts it's fine like but it just tells you what somebody wrote down mm -hmm. it doesn't tell you what what is true thank you so yeah seeker 206 thank you for answering my question guys i asked because in my mind israelite religion is similar to vedic religion not monolithic yep i your work I shows agree. that I agree. I think that's the, I think, I think humans have a tendency to try and categorize things and, and understand things. And then we make things more monolithic than they usually are. Um, and more recent religious studies has, has shown us that we often misunderstand religion because we accept that the texts, the most common texts are reflective of the way people act and think and practice their faith where in reality the the majority of of people aren't living or acting or practicing their religion based on the texts well put thank you tw says when was time century was the eradication of ashra poles order was that i think they mean during second temple or after 70 a.d uh, so no, this was this was much earlier. I mean, the the eradication of Asherah poles was um, so. I mean, it depends on 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 who you who you listen to, what you believe. But the the most common uh, I would say the most common dating of the earliest time that we would think that happened would have been during the time of Josiah the king uh, of of Judah, which is then around six twenty two BC, and that it would be when I would say a lot of scholars think that this reform was started in in Judah, that where the um, yeah the the king says, nope, we need to take back the religion or whatever. We need to centralize everything. We need to burn all the cults and all the other places for worshiping right. the the other gods and worshiping God even anywhere else. So Yahweh couldn't also be worshipped anywhere else, and we bring it all into the to the to the temple in Jerusalem. It's called like the cult centralization of Josiah. And that is like literally less than 30 years before, well, yeah, 30 years before the first Babylonian uh, attack on Jerusalem. So it's right before the exile is, is what, what that is. And, and I, I, I'm not sure I'm convinced that it starts then. I think maybe this is also retro retrojected from a, from a time 30 years later when the Babylonians are destroying and they start to think, man, we should have listened to somebody, but I don't know. Yeah, there's no way to really be too no overly to really confident. Know. Thank you, no. T.W. S Sitarkos, what, wasn't uh, Yahweh's wife a knot at the Elephantine Temple? Um, yeah, so I, I honestly remember. So that's a really good question. So a knot is Baal's wife in, in the Ugaritic texts. And, uh, and so I... I, I, when you, when I, when I see that, I think probably there's something to it, but I just can't remember. I can't remember. I don't have the text in the top of my head. Um, right. so, um, but, it, but a knot is also in the Ugaritic pantheon and is the wife of Baal. And there's a, there's a great text called the bloodbath of a knot or something like that. That's uh that's such, it's a great text, but that also has a, has a pretty uh, clear connection to Psalm 23. It's like though I walk through the valley of shadow of death and uh, like dining at a knot's table at the end and stuff like that. So, huh. um, but yeah. So, but sorry, um, set across. I I I don't remember. I I feel embarrassed because one of my colleagues is like an elephantine expert, so he'll probably. Can laugh you connect at me with them? Yeah. Uh, I'd well, love to. Yeah. Huh. I'd love to talk cool. to them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for that super chat. Victor Engelman, Asherah had 70 children. Jacob's family has 70 members. Coincidence or are there more connections? Well, and there were 70, um, 70 nations in the in Genesis 10, Table of Nations. So what does this tell us? That the number 70 was important. It right. was 
Yeah. I mean, I think that's it's, the it's least not a, it says that. It's, yeah. it's not a coincidence. I think this is a this is kind of the number that you put out there to to be yeah to be complete uh, at a certain point in history. And so, yeah, so I think it, it does make sense that Ash, Ash was described as having 70 children and the nations are 70. And the, yeah, it's a, it's kind of a, how many are you going to go? Ah, let's get to 70. So technically to be fair, right? This doesn't prove that that is a, like a direct connection, but it lends its weight well, toward it, especially since we think the early Israelites came out of Canaan, or at least a lot of Canaanite uh, ideas are, are, Embedded right. into well, their idea. I would just say that it's just part of it, it, it. I don't think it shows influence one way or the other, but it just shows that these are just common tropes that are mm -hmm. that are used. And whether or not there was uh, like the birth of the seventy members of the of a, whether it's the seventy nations or the seventy members of Jacob's tribe or the Jacob's family, I don't know. Like it, it's uh, I don't. I don't necessarily see it as a connection, but I think it's just like, it's part of a more common use of the number 70 than it is a connection between the two. Thank you so much. Hit the like button. And the next super chat, Constellation Pegasus asks, so let me share my screen real quick just to get this point across. Uh, subscribe to Dr. Munger. We're going to refresh this at the end. Stay tuned. We're almost there, everybody. Um, I ask that, uh, please, no more super chat questions. If you want to throw a super chat just to show love, you can, but I don't want any more questions. I want to wrap this up for Matt because I know it's getting late where he lives. It's starting to, he's got dinner coming up and um, I love him enough not to keep him here hating us forever. Um, okay. These are the statues I believe he's talking yep. about. I wonder how much money for one of those statues. Well, I don't even know if uh, they're sell, but. No, I, so I think he's, I think he's just being funny. So it's okay. a constellation. Um, I, I, uh, so I think this is one of those things here in Norway. We don't make jokes about those kind of things with antiquities anymore. After the whole Martin Skayen, uh, Ooh. said, Oh, I wonder if I could find me some dead sea scrolls from the book of Enoch. And then three months later, he could buy some for a few hundred thousand dollars. Like, uh, so, but yeah, the, um, those are, those are probably, I'm, I mean, I would imagine some of those were sold on the antiquities market at some point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, when you see it Especially in the museum, Matt, you have to wonder how it got there. But uh, thank you. Constellation yep. says again, did Jehovah abuse his wife or treated her the way society did? <laughs> well, it's a fictive anyway. But yeah. Yeah. I, pro I mean, the, unfortunately, we don't have those stories, but at, at Ugarit, they of course, they fight. And, uh, and that's the, I mean, that's the, the battling of the gods is there in the Ugaritic stuff. But, uh, but I guess. I wonder I've, why the gods have to fight. Do, do humans never fought each other though, right? Not humans my, always not my family. family. No, not my family's yeah. good. So why would the gods be fighting? Is it because we're just like them made in their image or would it be because I digress. I digress. Uh, confusing. Confusing. Really interesting. I'm. I gotta stop being corrupt here. Uh, Patrick Miller, thank you for the super chat. Really appreciate it, Pat. Did I see you have a question? Matthew, can you read and explain, please? Book of Judges six twenty five. You want me to read and explain Judges six twenty five? Judges six twenty five. Yeah, I mean, and so I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the what the point is, but I'll I'll do it. Um, so we're at the. Um, I think this is the this is the story of um, of Gideon, and uh, so I mean, part of the story of Gideon is that Gideon is told. Um, so this is the text is six twenty. Five, yeah. And that night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull, the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that belongs to your father and cut down the Asherah that is beside it and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold there. So that's, uh, so it's, um, so I'm, I'm guessing. That the the question is how to explain that within the framework of what we've been talking about, and I just say this is a this is a story about ancient Israel where their Gideon's dad has an altar to Baal and Asherah, and 
the story says that Gideon needed to cut it down for God to do what he wants to save Israel. And so it seems to me like it's just a pretty clear, again, kind of retrojecting this destruction of all the all the other gods. And it's it's acknowledging the reality of of wor the worship of Baal and Asherah in the in the Israelites past and saying that but from that perspective that it, it's if you do what I say and destroy those things and then, then God will be nice to you. I think it's interesting you got Baal and then Bel and then you have Yahweh and both are seen as having a named deity Asherah as a wife and El also had Asherah as a wife uh, like competition going on here with like different gods are married to this goddess named Asherah. Yep. Very fun stuff. Jerry Springer in the ancient world. D. That's Morris, true. the Bible doesn't teach religion. It teaches those who are called to worship in spirit and truth. His ways are not our ways, but you make money just like the false church. Without faith, the Bible is sealed. Yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> that, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't know D. Morris, so I don't know what the, what the, whether, I mean, I'm assuming this is a serious, uh, I, yes, I just chuckled, you know, so, it's like, I mean, I'm just, all, all I, all I'd say is that, you know, I, I know, I know how faithful and serious I was for so long and the, 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 this honest searching to understand the Bible, um, did, did not lead me to, um, the same conclusion that D Morris came to. So I, I don't appreciate being, um, being told that I was never faithful or that I didn't, I didn't honestly seek or that I was, I only left Christianity because I wanted to drink with Kip Davis. Somebody wrote to me. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> I mean, but, but I, it's, I, I just, I think it's like, yeah, I'm, and I'm not here to make money either. I don't know, Derek, you're, you're, you're more of a money man than I am. Yeah. But, uh, this is what I do yeah. for a living. Yeah, and it's obviously, this is uh, what I, I do just, is obviously, I just do this to torture myself. Day. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 this is war video, right? Yeah, this yeah. is the stuff that gets imposed and constantly put out there on people. And I just want to mention maybe this person, I know th they say the Bible doesn't teach religion. It teaches those who are called to worship in spirit and truth, which automatically takes me to the new Testament. Yeah. His ways are not our ways, which is old Testament phraseology, but probably used in the new Testament, but you make money just like the false church. And what's really interesting, just to help our friend D. Morris pay attention to 1 mm -hmm. Corinthians 9, about the Apostle Paul and the earlier apostles who were making money and had wives doing their work from the churches that they were working with. So unless you want to just say Jesus was the only guy who wasn't making any money because he says he doesn't have a head to lay his, or he doesn't have a home to lay his head in, the apostles after him actually start making money from the churches and Paul's pissed because, well, hold on. Don't I have right as well? I'm not asking for your money, but he asks for the money and he thanks them for the money. So your very foundation of this text, based on the fact that a church making money or people who are in the church are making money doing what they're doing really collapsed because the very foundation of this movement is dependent on the funds from those members of that church making money, doing it. So I'm just following suit with the apostles and making money for a living, doing what I'm doing. No different than them. Can I not yeah. do that? Uh, anyway, my thoughts. Yeah. Seeker, thank anyway. you so much for that. <laughs> Amen. Is that what you said? Amen. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Seeker's Go back. On, if Ash huh? No, I just said preach it, brother. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm Amen. just learning from your teachers. If Asherah got canceled during Josiah, is there any evidence, any at all, for Israelites viewing their dispersion as vengeance for rejecting their indigenous polytheism? If, I mean, if I understand you right, that they're, you're asking whether um, Israelites view, I mean, if they... So yeah, so I mean, if, if you're if you're if what what you're asking is whether or not we see it in the text of the Bible, then then I mean that's that's basically what we see is that the the entire narrative 
and and what we see in the prophets, the the exilic prophets, that what they see is that their their tendency towards polytheism is, or it's not framed as polytheism, but it's their tendency towards um, worshiping other gods is what led them to destruction, and what allowed God to to give up on them and allow the Babylonians to come and take them. And the same I think with the, the question is saying the opposite, though. I think what they're asking is: Is there any evidence at all that Israelites were viewing their dispersion, whether Assyrian, Babylonian, whatever, is as a vengeance, a vengeance almost from the pantheon? Okay, because so, they rejected the indigenous polytheism. So like, oh, instead, you know how we get the narrative that okay. it's because you guys worshiped all these other gods. So, well, just seek or put, 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 just write in the chat real quick what you, what, what you mean. Um, cause I, so I'm thinking it may be though, that means Israelites. So you're thinking the Northern kingdom. Um, so if you're thinking whether the Northern kingdom, so, and this is, this is definitely, um, something that's happening. Um, no myth vision is hundred percent correct. Okay. There you go. Okay. okay. So uh, thinking that it's vengeance from the other gods and not from Yahweh. Right. Like oh. it's almost like you guys, you rejected the old time religion, which is poly or, it, you know, it's many gods. No, I imagine I people probably did think that at some point. I, I, I like Maybe. it. I mean, I, I, I think it's a great counter narrative, but, uh, but I don't see it as the, um, I don't. I don't see any evidence of that in the texts. Um, I think. Um, no, I, I. I mean, I think that pretty straight across the board that what they're what they are doing is is interpreting is that God is has abandoned them and allowed the other gods to come in, and that and yeah, and the other gods then represent the other people, or like the Babylonians can come because there because Yahweh leaves the people undefended. And that's kind of the, yeah, that's kind of the narrative that comes about, but I like, yeah. I like the thought of it. I mean, it's a, but it would, you would have to find it in another text like that. Uh, uh, yeah. I don't know where I'd find it. Yeah. I mean, that would be cool. If you stumbled across something that was like an inscription somewhere or something happened where they're like, Hey, we're, you forsook us and yeah. you know the power of the queen of heaven uh, plays a role and like what the heck were you doing no wonder god scattered you or whatever but we don't yeah. obviously uh, we don't i don't have i haven't seen anything like that that would be cool i think we but caught we up on the supers so yeah, good now it's to the fun part and getting you off for dinner but the way we're going to do that is we're going to stop the poll number one 702 people voted vote you got three seconds to vote in the chat right now do you think yahweh had a wife named asherah yes no don't know and i'm going to close the poll here in three two one ending poll and what is the verdict? 59% of people say yes. 26% say, I don't know. And then 13% said no. Okay. That's an interesting number. That's pretty, pretty, we had a lot of voters on that. Yeah. I, I mean, I think honestly, I'd uh, say it's, I, I'm probably 50%, 56% or whatever convinced that, that Yahweh had a wife. So, um, and <laughs> I'd, I'd say the other forty-four percent is uh, is is not sure, just because I don't know with whether the terminology of wife or consort or anything like that really gives us anything. So, like, I mean, in the, at the end of the day, like, I think it's very clear Yahweh is is um, juxtaposed with a female deity whose name is Asherah in a number of contexts. And uh, both in the temple and in texts, and whether or not then we call it a wife or a right. uh, a consort or a female counterpart, or that Asher is just the female deity or whatever. Like I don't know. I mean, I have no idea. Uh, but I think it's uh, it's it's worth having the discussion. I think so as well. And but uh, I don't think that we can uh, deny the uh the existence of asherah or wait 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 i didn't mean that we can't deny the 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 acknowledgement of her in the texts and right. the the acknowledgement in the in the 
archaeological uh, remains and stuff like that. Thank you for that compliment, uh, Brilliant Beaches. We appreciate it. Seriously. Thank you. Okay, I've tried to let everybody know the end is nigh, and now your vote matters, right? We've, we've done that, but I need you to subscribe to Dr. Munger, and we're about to refresh that and see how many subscribers he has gotten or he has received since we started the stream. I, I left this not refreshed from the beginning. We may have had a few trickle in, but 4.57K is what we started at. I'm sure many of our viewers were already subscribed, but let's see if we have really grown since then. Here we go. Three, two, one. Four point six four. So That's I don't good. even know number wise. How how many is that? Uh, so we would have gone up um, from. Like that means we got about like 80, 70 or 80 new people, Ooh. I think, just during this. Okay. I like it. I like ye. And I know that it's going to grow since like this stream. We're going to be seeing that number change. I want everyone to go check out his website as well. Is there anything they can access through the website yet, or is it not really? Yeah. So if you go up into the menu on the top, it's on the left, and just hit that first one, Receptions in the Bible. Um, there I've, so I'm putting up the stuff and you've got, so this is the, I mean, those are the videos I've done. So you can cl click on that on one of them and it'll take you in and it'll give you the, the resources that are there. And my plan is then to write stuff, but here's links to, um, different articles, different translations, things like that. Um, books that you could buy that are about the topic. And then my, uh, eventually when I, when I get time, I'm going to add, like just brief summaries of stuff so that you can uh, kind of use that as a resource. Wow. And yep. And then, yeah. So my, yeah, right now I've been doing the creation stuff. So I did the Enuma Elish and then talked about the, the garden of Eden uh, in the last video. So the snake in, uh, in Gilgamesh that steals eternal life and comparing it with the, with the Eden narrative. And now I'm going to jump away from Genesis to look at a couple other creation things in my next two videos. So I've got one come out this weekend sometime I'm working on where we're going to look at uh, John 1 and the, uh, the word uh, and see what that's doing. So we're going to be okay. playing with some, uh, some, some Greek philosophy and things like that. And then I'm going to do a quick one on the uh, Book of Jubilees and the rewriting of Genesis 1 in the Book of Jubilees, which is okay. the most fascinating thing. And then, then we're going to plow on to other stuff. So, I'm looking forward to it, and I hope we can have you back here sometime in the not-too-distant future. Um, help support us. Become a patron of what we're doing. Take a course, especially the most recent. Reading the Gospels was one eye on Greek poetry. Can you, I mean, look, Dr. Munger, your, your specialties, you know, Dead Sea Scrolls, Hebrew Bible, philological approaches. You can read multiple languages. Do you have an opinion about Dennis McDonald's work? And maybe we can encourage some people to take the course. I want to yep. show them how nice it is while you do that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I've I've known about uh, Dennis's work from actually a, a lot longer than I've known about you. So this is, I mean, I, I learned a lot of things from you for the first time. But Dennis McDonald, I'd actually known about because one of my colleagues here in Norway has has been one of Dennis's kind of staunchest opponents and uh, yeah. has written a number of books kind of giving him the uh, a lot of, yeah giving him a lot of criticism and and so I've I've read Dennis trying to kind of figure out what's what's going on there and um I have to say like from for me Dennis uh, he really speaks to the, I, I, I agree a lot with his methodologies and I agree definitely with, with some of his conclusions, his, his way of saying that the Bible was not so the new Testament, the gospels were not written in a vacuum. That was only the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew scriptures, but that they also are participating in the world of Greek literature is, is extremely convincing. 
and some of the parallels that he has are are for me um yeah they they're i i i I don't see how they can ex be explained in any other way than knowledge of of the Homeric episodes being woven into the the New Testament. And so, I'm with you. The, it, it, yeah, it, admittedly, some of those are weaker, without a doubt. He says so himself, and he's the guy who wants to obviously let people see it. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's there's so much here that I think you can't sell even. Even I, who am very sympathetic to it and, and am convinced he's on to something here, and there are certain things that I'm not sure if that is a connection, but there's some that I'm so confident in yeah. that I can't not see that as like the best explanation for what we're looking at. I agree, hundred percent, and and that's the and the, I mean and that's the that's the work of a of a scholar like like Dennis McDonald is he he's he's one of the few people that is is skilled in both the the classic uh homeric and, and classic greek texts and the new testament and so and you have to be both to be able to point out the parallels uh like you you can't you can't just be somebody who studied the new testament for 30 years and then reads homer once um <laughs> but you, you you know and 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 so i understand that people that that are looking at it will be skeptical but it's like it's methodologically very sound and i i and i think it it's just important to um it's important to take things uh <laughs> take things like that seriously um yeah so it's i would i would i this is the kind of thing i just wish when I when I was a student, you know, when I was first starting out, I wish this kind of thing that you're doing had existed, so that I Thank could get access to these high quality scholars in a in a good, easy format. Um, you know, well, it's it's really amazing. Yeah, we didn't have even when I first started Myth Vision, this kind of stuff was not out there, which what is what inspired me to use my imagination and my creativity to try and bring it to the world. And look, this is just lecture seven, right? I've been like teasing people, just showing them one through six. There are 18 lectures in this series, of course, where he picks. We almost did 22. By the time we started tapping out ourselves, we were so exhausted. We were like, we're going to have to cut through these. We're going to have to skip these four and go with these. And we chose the ones we wanted to go with. But like it's – there's so many examples and stuff that he goes into his book on. And then we have deep conversations during the course. But um, there's reader recommendations, all sorts of stuff in comparison. And this is just one course. We have – a quest for historical Jesus, which is the history of New Testament scholarship with Delcy Allison Jr. We have ancient mystery cults, seven of them with M. David Litwa. We have um, obviously Dennis McDonald. We have a course on the Gospel of Mark with James Tabor. All of that is at the MVPcourses.com, and it's in our description. I'll put it in the chat in case someone is interested in signing up. It helps the academics. So whatever course you take, they are being helped financially by that course. So you're supporting the academics you love and want to see, you know, grow and and want to see them come back and want to see them make appearances on YouTube more because they want to promote their work. Like your work on Jubilees, you don't want it to stay behind like a closed door. You want other academics engaging. But how good does it feel when you get that positive feedback from YouTube when someone – not the negative stuff. I know that – you know, but yeah. the positive stuff. How do you feel about yeah. that? Oh no, it's great, and and I I, you know, obviously the 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 reason I'm doing this now is because I really do believe that that we need to be communicating scholarship in a way that is accessible to everyone, mm. and and I I see more and more that people are interested and and want to engage with scholarship, want to know what's going on. But there's less and less people signing up to study things in the humanities and religious studies, things like that, because people need to get jobs, you know, and, and you, it's hard in, in the world we live in to put aside seven years to go do a bachelor's and a master's and get everything out of the way. Like, so we, we need to be out there sharing what scholarship is doing. 
And, and so I think that's like when people see that for what it is and can, can, and, and do that and give positive feedback, it's amazing. Like it's, uh, that's, that's, that's what, that's what the whole point is for me. Dr. Munger, I appreciate you coming on, being candid, being very open, transparent, and teaching us uh, the things you've learned and continue to do so. Is there any final words you would say to someone out there? Maybe they're struggling or maybe they're just needing to leave them with something. Maybe you got something on your gut that you want to put out there before we let you go. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you're, if you're struggling, you know, that's always just, you know, I think, I think a lot more people that are close to you understand you than you expect. Like, that's the thing I've learned. Like I've, I've been, uh, I've been amazed at the love my family has poured out on me going public with my stuff um over the past the past few weeks since we did our our live stream um of course there's a couple of people that don't like it but you know uh yeah. but i think like the the thing is if you wonder if you wonder about stuff ask questions if you're if you're feeling scared talk about it uh if you have existential grief or fear find someone you can talk to like it's not a problem mm -hmm. but being open and being willing to to work through questions um, like for me was just being able to like, like getting to that point where I didn't have any, I, I don't have any existential fear anymore. Um, because I, I've found good academic solutions to it, but you know, some people will feel different, but yeah, but you know, Thank this you. is, uh, this is what we're here for. I appreciate you. I really do. And I hope that everybody keeps strong, keep growing the community. You can help your scholars. You can help us by liking by dropping a comment, even after the stream, come back and let the algorithm know that we're, you know, being, we're being paid attention to so that they keep recommending this material and you can go and support, um, specifically support some of the academics. We have, have Patreon member like options. Um, you can support what we're doing. We have a Patreon. So those are options if you're available, but if you can't, you don't have the financial needs and some people don't. And I understand you can press that like button. You can share a comment or share it out on social media, wherever, let someone else see it. Um, but if you can't even do that, because some people are in bad, tough spots, whether they are in a difficult, dangerous place in the world or family members and they're afraid of what that might be, you can like the content and you can drop comments, create a an account under your, like a different name, right? So you can actually interact and enjoy being who you are. Um, so there's options. And I thank you for your time, Dr. Munger. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. And now we're going to exit the matrix. Son, do you want to know what the truth is? After this, there's no turning back. You take the blue pill and you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to. You take the red pill and you stay in Wonderland. And I show you just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more.